Perfect. All right. So we're going to kick off our uh, first panel today. Um, <clears throat> my name is Nate Soderstrom. I'm a senior editor at the Capital Forum. I'll be moderating our first panel, which will focus on the proposed merger of T-Mobile and Sprint. Uh, we've got a great group of panelists today who I will briefly introduce, uh, starting with the closest to me. Uh, should I ask you this before Philip Berenbrock? Uh, close enough. Close enough. Yeah. Is Senior Policy Counsel of Public Knowledge, where his work focuses on broadband competition, telecom and media mergers, and spectrum policy. He regularly advises policymakers on Capitol Hill, the Federal Communications Commission, and at executive agencies. For joining Public Knowledge, Philip was the Policy Director at the Internet Freedom Business Alliance. He also previously worked as an attorney in the tech, media, and telecom practice at Hogan Levels, and as Policy Counsel at the Computer and Communications Industry <coughs> Association. Uh, next, we've got Rob McDowell, who's a partner at Cooley, where he advises telecom, media, and tech clients on their most significant regulatory, legal, and business matters. Uh, Rob is also a former commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission, to which he was first appointed by President George W. Bush in 2006 and again by President Obama in 2009. During his tenure, Rob led efforts to expand consumer access to Spectrum through his work on the two largest wireless auctions in U.S. history at the time. While at the FCC, Rob also worked extensively on several large and complex mergers, including SiriusXM, Comcast, NBC Universal, Verizon Altel, and AT&T T-Mobile. Uh, next, we've got Jeff Blum, who is the Senior Vice President of Public Policy and Government Affairs for DISH, overseeing state and federal government affairs in Washington, D.C. For coming to DISH in 2005, Jeff was partner at Davis Wright Tremaine, where his practice focused on copyright, First Amendment, and anti-piracy litigation. Currently serves as chairman of the Satellite Broadcasting and Communications Association and was co-chairman of the Broadband Internet Technical Advisory Group from 2013 to 2015. Um, finally, we've got Alan Grunis, who's the co-founder of the Concurrence Group, where his practice includes advising clients on mergers and acquisitions, providing counseling on non-merger matters, and representing clients before the federal antitrust agencies. He has extensive experience in a range of industries, including media and entertainment, telecom, and the high-tech sector. Alan spent more than a decade at the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, where he led a number of merger and civil <clears throat> non-merger investigations. So we have a great panel today, um, four panelists with, I think, pretty strong viewpoints on the proposed merger of T-Mobile and Sprint. Um, I'd like to kick things off, and Alan, let's maybe start with you and work our way uh, back towards me. This question, obviously, everybody, I imagine, would like to answer. Um, which is this, what do you think is the right way for DOJ and the FCC to evaluate the proposed merger of T-Mobile and Sprint and why, and in your view, what's the right conclusion here? Okay, thank you, Nate, um, and thanks to Teddy and Capital Forum for inviting me here. Um, so I think um, there's an established framework at both agencies, and that's the appropriate framework to evaluate the merger in. Um, let's start with DOJ first. Um, at DOJ, the starting point um, is number one, HHIs and concentration that's relevant both under the merger guidelines and the case law. It's also supported by the empirical li literature. In this case, under any measure, the industry is highly concentrated and the merger would significantly increase concentration. So the starting point is going to be a presumption that the merger is anti-competitive. Number two, uh, DOJ evaluates how closely the two companies compete um, in their product offerings. Um, this is standard unilateral effects analysis. Here we have two companies that are very close to each other in product space. Um, they have a long history of going after each other competitively. So unilateral price effects in this case um, are likely to be significant. Um, number three is entry conditions. Um, DOJ will ask whether entry is difficult and what it takes to enter. Um, I don't think the world today is dramatically different in terms of new entry than it was during the AT&T T-Mobile transaction. Uh, Commissioner McDowell may disagree with me on that. Um, despite the party's efforts in the uh, Sprint T-Mobile merger to expand the product market. Um, I have been working for Communications Workers of America, I should have said that at the beginning, um, and we addressed this attempt to expand the product market in our comments and our reply comments. And um, Capital Forum has also written um, stories about it. Um, it seems wrong to look at non-facilities-based companies such as Google and Dish and Comcast and track phones as market participants. Um, and speaking of 
product markets. Uh, it's worth thinking about what the candidate product markets here are. Um, it seems pretty clear to me that there's an overall mobile telephony broadband services market, um, but there are several other candidate markets. Um, particularly relevant seems to be a narrower market for prepaid services. Um, I don't think the parties have done a particularly effective job of trying to take prepaid off the, mar off the table as a relevant market. Um, in terms of efficiencies, the only point I'll make right now is that the parties have offered a moving target. They started by arguing that the efficiencies are in 5G and are at least three to five years off. Um, their newest merger simulation um, seems to back off of that claim and make arguments about how 4G LTE quality will improve for both companies. Um, as we pointed out in our December 4 comments, that's inconsistent with what their own people have been saying. Uh, their goal in the next three years is uh, not to hurt the existing uh, service of Sprint and T-Mobile cu uh, customers during the migration period. They've said that repeatedly and, and under oath. Um, yet their newest group of economists is making a different argument about improvements in service for both companies during the integration period. This seems uh, contrary to fact, and it really strikes me as let's assume a can opener sort of argument. Um, so in sum, we have a deal where the harms are predictable and likely, and the benefits are speculative and distant. Uh, it seems pretty intuitive to me uh, that this is a good candidate for a DOJ challenge. Um, as for the FCC public interest analysis, the parties have made four claims in their public interest statement. The merger would increase jobs, would benefit rural America, is necessary for Sprint because it's failing or at least flailing, and it's necessary for the rollout of advanced 5G services. Um, we have, I think, debunked each of those claims in our comments and reply comments. Uh, so I think from the public interest standpoint, based on the record so far, the parties have not made their case, um, which is perhaps why they've decided now to take a new tack. Um, and again, I know Commissioner McDowell disagrees that this is a new tack, but um, I, to me it does seem like a new tack with the latest uh, merger simulation. Um, the new tack is that both Sprint and T-Mobile suffer from a quality gap um, quote unquote, with uh, AT&T and Verizon and need the merger to close the quality gap. Um, that claim, as far as I can recall, is not in their public interest statement. Um, it was raised five months into the uh, merger review at the FCC and after the comment period was over. Um, we've suggested, CWA suggested to the FCC that the applicants should be held to what they asserted in the public interest statement. If they're held to their claims and affidavits, they've really failed to show that the merger would be in the public interest. And I'll stop there. Uh, there are critiques of the new study, even if you were to think that the new study ought to be considered. Perfect. So, uh, Jeff, I get the sense that Alan uh, does not view the transaction as pro-competitive. Where do you come out on that question? I agree with Alan. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. It's always a lot of fun uh, to be on these panels. This is a pretty simple merger. It's horizontal. Every economist sort of understands how you evaluate it. We have established models that the FCC, DOJ, and the states have used for decades. And when you plug in the evidence and the data, it is clear that this merger will result in very significant unilateral price increases, and T-Mobile's own economists acknowledge this. Uh, the merger will result in very significant risk of coordination between AT&T, Verizon, and new T-Mobile that even under T-Mobile's own economists who invented this coordination model, prices could go up another 15 to 20% beyond the unilateral effects. So when you have that traditional horizontal harm, the case law and the precedent says that the applicants have to meet an extraordinary burden to show that the benefits 
outweigh these harms. And that's the actual word, extraordinary. And what do they look at? Because I agree with sort of what uh, Alan was saying. You have to look at whether these alleged benefits are quantifiable, verifiable, merger specific, and actually accrue within a reasonable time period, which is typically two to three years. Uh, and when you actually look at the evidence, T-Mobile's initial model, this was their engineering model where they claimed that independently there would be congestion on the networks and therefore they needed the merger to have these efficiencies to offer a true 5G. They've had to revise that model three times. DISH, we've hired seven economists and two engineers that have looked at this in great detail. And T-Mobile's own engineering model shows that the merger is not necessary for 5G. That each of them can get to 5G, and that's what they plan to do, and that's what they told the public repeatedly over the years, uh, and they have the ability to do other things besides merge and acquiring additional millimeter wave spectrum, for example. So that 5G claim is what they said justifies these very significant price increases. After there was a lot of critique of that claim, as, as Alan referred to, now they are saying, yes, there will be price increases, but consumers would be, quote, willing to pay these price increases for unverified benefits to 4G. They never said that there would be 4G quality improvements. So today, their economic theory for this merger rests upon this study called Cornerstone that is assuming, they just pulled out of thin air, hey, there will be a 10% 4G quality improvement, people will be able to have you know, 0.5 greater speeds on their network. This is literally their justification today, that if you plug in these uh, quality improvements, then consumers would be willing to pay these substantial price increases. There's many problems with this economic model. Uh, we submitted uh, a report last week to the FCC rebutting it. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's not gonna be 4G quality improvement. Both of them are doing 4G fine today. And the 5G claims are not till 2023. DISH, we want to be in the 5G business as well. We agree uh, that the U.S. should win the global race to 5G. But 5G is not the end of economics. We believe that the best way for the U.S. to win the race to 5G is through competition and not through consolidation. We are encouraged that the FCC, DOJ, and the states are conducting a thorough investigation as they should, looking at the evidence, looking at the data uh, to make what well, the right decision, and hopefully at the end of the day, we believe that right decision is block the merger as currently proposed. Rob uh, heard a lot about why the transition <laughs> is not good. Uh, where do you come out on that question? So first of all, thanks for having me. This is uh, great to be back. It's great to be back in the press club, by the way. My, my father was a member here for many, many years and got to see Itzhak Rabin and Boris Yeltsin and King Abdullah of Jordan right in the room next door. And, Sorry you're stuck with uh, me today, uh, given that uh, lineup, but I'm having a lot of flashbacks right now. But um, in any case, obviously I, I, I profoundly disagree with the premise. Um, first of all, to answer the question, and we're gonna, there's a lot to unpack there, um, but um, uh, I wanna make sure I, we save room and time for, for other questions, because we could uh, expound in great detail on that one question. But the standards certainly are consumer welfare and, and public interest, uh, both at DOJ and, and FCC. And let's you know, look at this from a higher altitude, which is, um, first of all, there's more competition in, in wireless. So there's more in the denominator. Uh, obviously, folks who are opposed to the deal want to look at the denominator, the definition of competition, or what's a competitive market or a substitute in a very narrow way. Um, but uh, this is an opportunity to actually redefine that, to, to look at that. You have the four national carriers, all with very different business footprints and different business models. Uh, if it's AT and DirecTV and HBO, you've got Verizon with uh, Oath and, and other things, uh, and, and, and T-Mobile and Sprint with their various assets, and Sprint primarily just a wireless carrier. You know, Marcella Claire um, at the Senate uh, Judiciary hearing in late June uh, pretty much said uh, Sprint cannot build out a national 5G network uh, under its current uh, debt load and uh, its uh, decreasing um, financial uh, condition. Um, the 
you know, Sprint and T-Mobile have been, and uh, T-Mobile in particular, has been taking uh, customers away from AT&T and, and Verizon. Uh, so this isn't, uh, you, you'll find, I think, this in the record that uh, in the long term, when it, when it all comes to light, um, that T-Mobile has been the maverick. Uh, this will make a supercharged maverick. You're not going from four to three, you're going from two to three, because 5G is an essential part of all this, and I know we're gonna probably talk about that later. But uh, you're either gonna have a third alternative to spend $40 billion over three years to build out a 5G network, or you will have two carriers who can do that. Uh, all great American companies, but um, do you want three to be able to do that, or uh, just two? And that's a fundamental question for American competitiveness, economic growth, and all the rest. And I know we're gonna talk more about 5G later, but that's a huge aspect of this. So this is a different kind of merger, different kind of merger review. And clearly it's very complex and there's a lot of data and, and different economists who, who can debate. Um, but uh, you know, HHI is not dispositive, it's actually not in the, in the statute anywhere. Um, and if you look at market concentration in wireless over time as HHI has gone up, actually uh, ARPU and, and consumer prices have gone down precipitously. And if these carriers are gonna be spending tens of billions of dollars building out uh, competing 5G networks uh, and start to raise their, if one starts to raise their price, they're gonna get their lunch eaten by, by the other two. It was T-Mobile that started um, you know, flat rates uh, and, and waiving uh, uh, early termination fees if you wanted to switch or they would, they would pay uh, your fee if you wanted to switch to them. And that, I think you're gonna see more of that, not less of that. That has been phenomenally successful with this company for the past four years especially. Um, and I think that the, that business model and that mindset's gonna continue. And, and, and it will be the T-Mobile management team that, that uh, takes over the combined companies. Um, so, uh, they, by the way, also one, one point of order. Uh, T-Mobile hasn't changed its models. It hasn't uh, changed tech. Uh, it is built on what's already in the record. So you had the announcement in early May you had uh, the public interest statement filed uh, over the summer, and obviously uh, a deal of this complexity and this size is gonna take a lot of supplemental filing. So there's, there, it takes time to have some of these models uh, created um, in between the, the deal announcement and when the public interest statement was filed. You know, you, you're gonna have the supplemental filings. So nothing, nothing has changed in the, in the actual premise, uh, just more data to support that original premise. I have tons more I can say, but I wanna, and I know I'm kinda out number three to one here. Uh, so maybe I'll get some extra time going, up, going down the road, but I uh, wanted to at least answer the question and then not all the other questions. Appreciate that, we can do that. Oh. Thanks. Um, thanks, Nate. Uh, and thanks again for Capital Forum for having me back. Um, it's good to, good to be here and good to see all of our friends here on the panel. Um, so I'm gonna start by answering the question and then I'm gonna quickly pivot to address, or maybe not so quickly, uh, pivot to address a couple of things that Rob mentioned. Um, that, that we dealt with, frankly, in our FCC filing, uh, especially in the reply round that we filed on Halloween. Um, so uh, quickly, um, you know, I think as a conclusion, what should, what should the uh, antitrust agencies and what should the FCC do? Um, public knowledge uh, has you know, filed on the docket, we filed a petition to deny, um, along with um, a very, you know, a, a, an all-star list of other uh, public interest NGOs. Um, and we, we asked the FCC to designate the transaction for assignment uh, before, or designate it for a hearing before an administrative law judge, which would effectively uh, kill the transaction. Uh, we've also said that the Department of Justice has sufficient grounds to sue to block the deal, uh, similar to uh, what the Department of Justice did uh, in transactions like Comcast, uh, Time Warner Cable, uh, and uh, sort of most similarly here, AT&T T-Mobile. Um, we've also, frankly, said that the state attorney generals should look at this deal, and they have plenty of grounds to oppose the deal uh, as harmful to consumers in the states. Uh, and then uh, the New York and the California State Public Utility Public Service Commissions are also looking at the deal, and we think they should also uh, move to deny it. Um, so why? And I, I think we've, we've talked a lot about some of the economics, um, and you know, I think you know, there's a lot of uh, debate about this being you know, so... Uh, you know, data intensive and economics intensive, uh, but the, the lucky thing is that we've seen this movie before. Um, the FCC, or the FCC and the Department of Justice in 2011 evaluated a very similar four to three merger. Um, and the Department of Justice sued to block the deal. The FCC was prepared to designate it for an administrative hearing 
uh, before the parties withdrew the transaction. Um, and and you know what the FC, what the DOJ said in litigation uh, holds true here. Um, a four to three merger in the wireless market uh, is going to, going to lessen competition. It will increase the risk of anti-competitive coordination between the remaining firms. Uh, it will lead to higher prices, uh, less variety of services and innovation in the marketplace, poor quality of services, and less incentives for the remaining firms to invest and compete with one another. Um, and, and frankly, I think that analysis holds true here today. And as far as the relevant product markets, um, you know, I think Alan you know, laid this out pretty clearly. Um, you know, this is obviously a transaction in the mobile voice and mobile broadband space. Um, it is not a broader market. The parties have tried to paint this as a you know, competitor to cable and sort of the fixed broadband markets or that there is, you know, I think, you know Rob, Rob's doing a yeoman's job, um, but he did, he, he, he did two things there. He said this is a two to three merger, so sort of implying that you only have, you know, you have a duopoly in the marketplace right now. But then he also said that you have these MVNOs and cable providers and other players, so, you know, the parties have been saying it's an eight to seven merger. They're making both those arguments at exactly the same time. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but so, the, there are other uh, sub-markets in the mobile voice, and tele, mobile voice and broadband market that we should be thinking about here. Um, so, for instance, uh, the prepaid and low-income market. These are two parties that have really pitched their services, um, especially in the prepaid space, um, and Sprint and T-Mobile have been uh, the most aggressive players at introducing lower priced plans uh, and leading the charge back into the unlimited uh, broadband market. Um, they, they, you know, primarily, uh, they're the primary service providers uh, for prepaid, prepaid and consumers that are making less than $75,000 a year. Uh, that's an important sub-market that DOJ and the FCC should look at. What happens to those consumers, especially as the models show, prices go up, and frankly, the, the whole premise for the merger is for the, for the companies to have a, have a structure that looks a lot more like AT&T and Verizon. That's not good for low-income consumers. Um, the other piece they should probably look at is the market for wholesale and roaming. Um, Post-transaction, uh, the parties are going to hold, the, the new T-Mobile would have about 45% of the wholesale market. The HHI in that market, you know, the regular mobile voice, tele, uh, mobile voice and broadband market, you've got an HHI of about 3,100 right now. Uh, this would add, which is already uh, highly concentrated under the horizontal merger guidelines. In that marketplace, you add, um, you add HHI to get to about 3,350 to 3,500. Um, in the wholesale market, you're at, it's already more concentrated than the regular uh, consumer marketplace but you're adding another 1,000 points of concentration in the HHI measurement. Um, so it goes off the charts. So the argument that you could actually see you know, new competitors emerge is, um, you know, is you know, this actually would for, foreclose the marketplace even more for companies that wanted to enter the market as MVNOs or rely on uh, these players as uh, roaming providers. Um, so that's, that's most of what I wanted to say. I think you know, where we stand is pretty clear. Um, but yeah, I, I'm happy to get into the 5G and some of the other issues. Yeah, too. absolutely. So yeah. I think that's a good overview of where, uh, how everybody's approaching this. I think, um, look, there are market definition questions, there are entry questions, but it seems like fundamentally a really big piece of what the agencies do here is on efficiencies. Um, when you think about market concentration that Philip alluded to, gross upward pricing pressure, these kind of standard metrics for evaluating horizontal mergers, you look at this merger and say, look, short-term price increases, that's the most likely outcome. The party's response is really pretty largely based on efficiencies and the potential for this really excellent 5G network, uh, which would be fully built out in, I believe, 2024, maybe 2023, but pretty decent time horizon. So, Ellen, I'll kick this over to you because you're the antitrust guy, but I, I'd like everybody to weigh in. Uh, like, fundamentally, how should FCC and DOJ weigh the possibility of short-term price effects against this promise of, and we should concede, very significant uh, longer-term benefits to the extent they realize how do we balance the short term against the long term when looking at this okay. um, So, you know, I, I can't help but be struck by uh, Commissioner Chopra's comments this morning about how antitrust law has enriched economists um, because at least in the FCC proceeding, um, the, the applicants have more than 60 economists who've signed onto the confidentiality order. Um, so, um, 
you know, there is one strategy which is just, you know, give people so much to chase that they can't chase the whole thing down, and I think that may be a strategy that's going on here. But to answer your question, um, as we've heard, I think it's, it's pretty certain uh, that there will be price effects in the near term, um, whether you look at the concentration measures or how closely the two companies compete. Um, eliminating that competition is likely to uh, result in higher prices. Um, and as uh, Jeff said, um, their own merger simulations, the applicants' own merger simulations predict price effects as part of their modeling. Um, but they've chosen not to show that, maybe for obvious reasons, um, in the reports themselves. Um, Professor Roger Knoll, who uh, was only looking at the public documents, um, said earlier this week at a California PUC um, workshop that the parties expect prices to go up 10 to 20 percent before factoring in claim deficiencies. Um, so we have the price effects on the one side. Uh, on the other side of the coin, the other side is um, the 5G argument. Um, this breaks down, I think, for numerous technical reasons. Um, one is that there is no single thing that is 5G. Um, there isn't even an agreement about standards yet. Um, as we've shown it with some engineering studies, using the applicant's own data, um, rural Americans are likely to see very little, if any, benefits from the merger. And part of that is just the law of physics and the nature of the spectrum that the applicants have. Um, on a more fundamental level, um, and it's kind of odd that I'm taking the conservative position here, but in a way I am, um, I think it's problematic for DOJ to be asked to look out five or more years into the future, especially in a market that the parties argue is dynamic and rapidly changing. Um, if I were at DOJ, I'd be reluctant to depart that much from the more or less two-year horizon that the, the guidelines have traditionally looked at. Um, and along the same lines, I think we need to realize that um, Sprint and T-Mobile have been pushing this merger um, now for several years. I was asked about it, I remember, more than four years ago at a, at a conversation um, with analysts and so forth. Um, 5G is just the latest justification for the merger. So I think you have to look at the 5G claims very critically. And if you look at AT&T, T-Mobile, what was their claimed efficiency and benefit in 2011, 2012? We will have the best 4G network in the United States. We need the merger in order to do that. The regulators made the smart decision in rejecting that and look at T-Mobile. I agree with Commissioner McDonald. We like T-Mobile. They are a maverick. They have brought competition. We're better off uh, because of the denial of that merger and their mavericky behavior. Sprint, also a maverick. The data actually shows that Sprint and T-Mobile are competing most closely to each other uh, rather than uh, AT&T Verizon. And so you see what happened when the regulators uh, made the right decision. There was greater competition. But let's take for a moment the applicants claim that in 2024, they'll have a great 5G network, really fast, tons of capacity, IoT, you know, full bore 5G network in 2024. We're in 2018. We have hundreds of millions of consumers today that have 4G cell phones. They're not transitioning to 5G anytime soon. So it's not short term. We're, we're talking four or five years uh, before these 5G claims could come into fruition. What about those people? When the data shows those people, hundreds of millions of people, will be paying significantly more. We're not talking pennies here. The public data, and I don't get to see the confidential data, unfortunately, but my economists do, my outside counsel do, the public data is showing these 15% price increases. T-Mobile's own economists had to acknowledge that the price increases would be more than that, a lot more. Because when you actually look at 
the diversion data, the porting data, it, the models are just blowing up and alarm bells are going off. So really that's the question. Will the DOJ, the FCC, and it's unique in that way, will they say 5G in 2024, um, we strongly disagree that it's necessary uh, in order to accomplish those goals, but let's assume it is. Is that in the public interest? Uh, does that comply with uh, antitrust law to allow four plus years of very substantial price increases, which is essentially undisputed? Uh, we just, we don't think it justifies it. Rob, what's he missing? Great, actually the, the price increases are, are disputed. Uh, the uh, T-Mobile the does not say that, uh, the models do not say that pricing, the pricing will go up. In fact, if pricing were to go up, uh, AT&T and, and Verizon would have a field day. Also the data show that uh, uh, T-Mobile's been gaining market share, it's been gaining market share, not from Sprint, it's been gaining market share from AT&T and Verizon who've been losing market share. Who have they been losing to? They've been losing to T-Mobile. Uh, it's all very clear in there. Competing economists can have uh, different views or come up with uh, arguments, uh, but that's not what the T-Mobile data show, that, that, uh, that uh, prices are going to go up. And it's certainly not going to go up in, in, in the course of 5G. So we, we you know, everyone can shapeshift here on, on what uh, battlefield they want to be arguing on, 4G versus 5G, but this is really about 5G because it is coming. Uh, you have at and Verizon in particular you know, rolling out test beds uh, as we speak, um, and over the next five years especially, um, that's going to be what's going to be built out. So you have to look at that. It has to be at the core uh, of, this, uh, of this discussion. A, a couple of quick things. There's a lot thrown out there, so hopefully I'll get just a little bit extra time uh, uh, rather than three to one. Um, so with AT&T T-Mobile, I was at the FCC uh, when that was there, uh, when that was being proposed. Uh, you had uh, the number two combining with the number four to make the number one, uh, and it was a different kettle of fish that never came to a vote at the FCC. I actually never saw the complete record uh, before DOJ and the FCC essentially uh, killed it. Um, but nonetheless, you had number two and number four uh, combining to make a number one. In this case, uh, T-Mobile, the new T-Mobile, would still be number three, that it's still dwarfed by at and and Verizon by every measurable metric, whether it's CapEx, free cash flow, whether it's number of subscribers, certainly the amount of spectrum with Verizon, great American company, having the, the most by far, uh, followed by at and t and, and, and uh, the new T-Mobile having the, the least of those three. Um, subscribers, did I say that part? I can't remember which uh, metric, but every metric you look at, it's still the, the smallest of, of the three. Um, and it will still then therefore have an incentive to take market share away from AT&T and Verizon, whether it's competing on 4G or 5G, but in the long term it'll all be 5G. Um, and, and so those are the incentives. It's not to be sclerotic and to sit there and carve up a pie. That's not gonna pay back their investors for the $40 billion in CapEx that they need to borrow uh, to build it, out, build it out, which will not happen. That $40 billion will not, so what everyone on this panel is arguing is you want two national carriers for 5G. That would be the net result of shooting down this merger. So keep that in mind. But we have seen this movie before, too. Uh, we've seen this movie in a smaller case study. All of these arguments were made when T-Mobile acquired Metro PCS, and I was uh, at the commission when that started. Uh, and that was uh, over five years ago that that was consummated, especially when you look at the, the market in Miami. So this was used as a, um, as a template, as a microcosm, uh, for what is now a national debate. But all these same arguments were made because in the market of Miami, there would be uh, a, a higher concentration. Um, and uh, everything from jobs would be lost, to be, there would be less CapEx, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Prices would go up, and all the opposite happened. Prices went down, innovation went up, uh, build out uh, and, and network enhancements went up as well, and employment went up by 3x uh, when you count uh, the agents, the independent sales agents and such, by 3x. So the, the job predictions, remember at the time, by the critics were there would be massive layoffs because of Metro PCS. There was actually not just an increase, but a 3x increase uh, with the Metro PCS unit of, of what is now T-Mobile. Um, when it comes to, you know, on the MVNO arguments too, which is you, you have seen historically T-Mobile and, and Sprint be the most wholesale or MVNO friendly. Uh, we think that will uh, continue, and that will continue because if you're going to spend $40 billion on a new sparkly, shiny, uh, wonderful 5G network, uh, you need to bring in revenue uh, to pay for that again. And so uh, if you've got a good thing going with a uh, wholesale-friendly or MVNO-friendly uh, program, you're going to want to keep that. 
Um, and so uh, at and and Verizon will, may you know, respond in kind because they'll realize that actually there's some avoided cost by being a wholesaler, um, and there's still plenty of, of margin to help uh, pay back uh, your lenders for that all that capex. Uh, so uh, that, and also, by the way, the prepaid argument, uh, which is that's another form of paying for something, not necessarily another market, that's like layaway, it's, it's the same service, uh, you're just paying for it, you're financing it a different way. Um, and then, uh, Rural build-out, that was another uh, issue that was raised, uh, which is there's a tremendous amount of untapped potential in rural America. You could have upwards of 25 million, maybe even more, uh, rural Americans without broadband, really. Um, and 5G uh, offers great hope uh, for that. And T-Mobile is going to expand 600 stores. They're going to have five new call centers, et cetera. Uh, but the rural market, which is untapped and potentially actually lucrative, quite honestly, and that's what uh, helps to pay for all this, um, and T-Mobile is, is making an aggressive uh, stance uh, there in, in rural America. So, you know, we all know that uh, 5G is coming. Uh, and to merely make this a, a discussion about 4G or 5G is too far down the road, it's not. Uh, it's being built now in test beds, and it absolutely has to be part of the conversation going forward. Philip, what do you think? I'll have to respond to you. Um, <clears throat> So I, I'm going to address the 5G issue, I think, uh, just to start. Um, so you know, one thing that the Commission and the Department of Justice should be doing when they evaluate this transaction is they should look at what, what, what were the parties saying about their deployment plans before they announced the merger? Um, you know, what were they telling investors? What were they filing in their SEC statements? What were they saying in marketing? What were they saying? at conferences like this um, and in ex parte meetings at the FCC um, and in filings. Uh, what were they, and, that, and, and, and how has the story changed now that they've decided they need to sell the merger? And the stories are, are diverge incredibly. Um, so if you look at you know, pre-April uh, of this year, uh, both companies were saying that they were planning to build nationwide 5G networks, that they were going to be the first to 5G. They were going to have the best, the fastest 5G. Um, those were claims both, both companies were largely making out in the marketplace to investors. Um, and you know, now it's, now the story is we can't do it without each other. Um, and the story is that Sprint is enfeebled and sp Sprint is failing and you know, they, they need this merger uh, or otherwise they're not going to survive. Um, so if I'm the Department of Justice or the FCC, um, and as public knowledge, you know, we've, we've uh, suggested they do this, I would compare those statements. Um, and you know, frankly, the, the statements to investors and to the SEC, those are made under penalty of perjury. Um, and the statements to the FCC, these are both licensees before the FCC. So if they make material misrepresentations before the FCC, their licenses are on the line. You know, we're seeing some of this with the, you know, the aftermath of the Sinclair uh, Tribune transaction. Uh, there was, you know, there were concerns about lack of candor. Um, so, you know, this is a serious issue, and you know, I, I, I take it pretty seriously, and I think the, the regulators should too. That the companies were promising 5G. They were promising standalone nationwide 5G to compete with each other and Verizon and AT and T. And now they're saying they can't do it. Why? What's the difference? And the difference is largely they have a merger to sell to regulators. And frankly, you know, we talked up top about some of the, the likely price increases, the like of increased coordination, uh, the, lack, the, the decrease in innovation, all the harms that DOJ and the FCC spotted in the last four to three merger proposal. And those are clear here. And so you see the parties leaning incredibly hard on you know, the purported merger specific benefits. So rural broadband, you know, I think every congressional committee has had a hearing this year or last year on rural broadband deployment, and they should. That is an important issue. But this merger does nothing for rural broadband deployment, despite what the parties are saying. They're not building fiber to rural America. 5G, anybody you talk to about 5G deployment, 5G using mid-band spectrum or millimeter wave spectrum, with that, which that's what we're talking about with 5G, that's not useful in a rural America, typically. The propagation characteristics just don't work out for rural deployments, and the economics of deployment haven't worked for rural America using 
600 and 700 and the lower band spectrum that T-Mobile holds, that Verizon and AT&T hold, um, it hasn't worked with, with spectrum that's less costly to build out. We're not building fiber to those places. What changes with this merger? Nothing, nothing changes. They're not talking about deploying fiber to rural America. They're talking about, you know, using mid-band spectrum to serve rural America, but the propagation characteristics don't work. It makes, it makes no sense. Um, and then a another thing I just want to highlight on the spectrum piece. Um, so T-Mobile and Sprint are saying, look, we, you know, our, our networks combined will provide so much synergy. Uh, and and T-Mobile is saying that it needs mid-band spectrum like Sprint's 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. Um, but yesterday, yesterday the FCC released or voted to approve something called the Communications Marketplace Report. And buried at the end of that report, uh, they talk about next steps we're taking to promote wider deployment of 5G mobile broadband networks. And the FCC says that, be t that you know, with actions they're prepared to take on freeing up spectrum in the 3.5 gigahertz band. There was a vote in October about licenses in the 3.5 gigahertz band that T-Mobile desperately wants. Um, there's a proceeding underway in the 2.5 gigahertz band to open more of that up for mobile broadband 5G. There's a proceeding underway in the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band to open 500 uh, megahertz spectrum potentially up for some sort of mobile broadband use 5G. This is all the mid-band spectrum that the parties are saying is essential for 5G. There's 800, the, the FCC, this is what the FCC said yesterday. They said they're moving to open up 844 megahertz of mid-band spectrum for 5G. So the parties are saying this is the only spectrum available for, for mid-band for 5G deployment. And the FCC is saying exactly the opposite. They're saying there's 844 megahertz that's in the pipeline that's probably going to be available before the speculative date of 2024 that the parties are actually going to get their 5G network off the ground. So you do not need, the, so, five, so what I'm saying is access to mid-band spectrum is not a merger specific benefit here. And the whole point is 5G. The whole argument is 5G is the, is the big merger specific benefit, but the FCC's data, what the FCC just published yesterday, undermines the credibility of that entire argument. And can I just add uh, to Commissioner McDowell's point on the economists, what T-Mobile's economists have done is they have taken what T-Mobile has told them, the $40 billion number, these, the efficiency number, and they've assumed it. They haven't independently verified whether that $40 billion number is real or not. So the models, if you strip away that $40 billion number as not quantifiable, not verifiable, their own economists are showing very significant price increases. So that's the first thing, and if the regulators don't buy the $40 billion efficiencies. And there's a host of problems with it. You can read our filings and CWA's filings on it. Many flawed assumptions, contradictions, speculation about what uh, the network would be. You're left with very substantial price increases. The second thing that they've done is really not talk about 5G. Their most recent cornerstone study is all about 4G uh, that they submitted, by the way, after the pleading cycle ended. They could have run this months ago. And their new study is all based upon supposed 4G quality improvements because they recognize this gap between 2018 and 2024. How do you explain to justice and the FCC and the states, well, what about price increases for 4G? And that is why their new study is so-called 4G quality improvements, which is not what the applicants were talking about uh, in the beginning because no one believes you need the merger to have a good 4G network. We have really good 4G network today, thanks to T-Mobile and Sprint and what they've done to add competition. And the concern is about incentives. T-Mobile is a maverick today. Sprint is a maverick because they're able, and their goal is to gain market share through unlimited plans, great pricing, focus on veterans, prepaid, that's all good. But when you use the government to merge and artificially create a market share comparable to AT&T Verizon, why do you need to be a maverick anymore? That's what their own economist uh, studied. It's called the Coordinated Price Index, that when you have large incumbents that have similar characteristics in terms of market share, they will coordinate, they will collude on rates because they all have the same market share, so why not raise prices? And that's in addition to the unilateral price increases that the model shows. So Rob, I'm gonna let you 
<clears throat> respond to that, but I want to throw in a, another question, um, which is the idea that the merging parties have pitched this deal, uh, again, in large part, as we've talked about, on the benefits of this new 5G network. And um, it comes in the context of a lot of concern from the administration around, obviously, uh, China and winning the 5G race in particular. Uh, we want to you know, have the U.S. of global leadership in 5G, really, really important priority. Um, not really a competition issue per se, but how should, quote unquote, winning the 5G race, um, especially against China, how should that play in, look, the FCC evaluates this under the public interest, um, how should the idea of winning the 5G race play into thinking about this merger? Yeah, and it's not just China, it's Asia generally. Uh, of course, Europe would love to, you know, we, we beat the world, the U.S. beat the world in 4G, right? And so uh, you went from, uh, when I was at the commission, to uh, having 3G, uh, to having 4G, thanks to some spectrum auctions and then uh, the wonderful brilliance of, of the private sector. Um, and the U.S. leads by far the app economy. Uh, and that has produced a lot of different studies, a lot of different numbers, but let's say hundreds of billions of dollars and potentially millions of jobs just in this country. Uh, and, and we were able to set the standards. We were able to come out with the patents, the patent holders um, in this regard, whether they were algor algorithmic or, or chips or whatever. Um, really made the U.S. The, the place to be and uh, for the mobile internet. And whoever, whichever country uh, kind of gets to market first uh, with 5G uh, will reap the most rewards. I, I wrote a, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about this in late, uh, late September. Um, so it's very real. Uh, you certainly have Japan. Uh, Japan wants to make the 2020 Olympics a uh, showcase for their 5G technologies. Um, you have the uh, pending combination of uh, China Telecom and China United, which would make a 5G behemoth, um, and China is very determined uh, to get there to get there first. Um, so, again, what the, the the arguments, and I disagree with the premise of pretty much every single argument that's been made today. We don't have time to deconstruct all of it because I think we're already over time. Um, but are essentially saying you want two 5G national 5G carriers. Um, because the data does show, the math shows quite simply that standalone T-Mobile or Sprint cannot spend the money uh, quickly enough or at all to begin with uh, to build out 5G. And so if the combination will accelerate that, that, uh, that build out, that will uh, create a, a competitive effect against at and Verizon in particular and cable and DISH and, and other uh, competitors in this space. Um, and by the way, the use of unlicensed spectrum, which never gets discussed, that gets buried. Uh, when we start talking, uh, you know, my 11-year-old is not a subscriber, but he lives off the land uh, from, from unlicensed to unlicensed for his vi video data and, uh, and voice, uh, and does so quite well. And I think he's not the only one in the country. Uh, I'd love to know, uh, what, uh, you know how, how much more there is uh, out there. But um, so it's absolutely essential. When we see that the rise of Internet of Things and what's going to happen globally, uh, we need, the U.S. needs to be a leader in 5G. There's unanimity on that, um, and, or near unanimity. I'm sure there's always somebody who's going to disagree. But uh, so we need to facilitate that. Um, and, and, and trying to shoot this down through a, a lot of things that just aren't going to bear out. And again, I keep going back to the Metro PCS example where all these arguments were made. There would, it would not be completed in time. There would not be enough capex. There would be job loss. Uh, prices would go up. Uh, the opposite of all those allegations uh, came true. Why? Because it's a cutthroat competitive industry. And, and the last point, too, is 5G is more spectrally efficient, so it's cheaper to run. And that blend of spectrum uh, that Phil talked about, uh, of low band, mid band, and, and, and millimeter wave, et cetera, uh, is actually perfect for uh, this to, to have a competitive threat. You'll still have the new T-Mobile holding the, lowest on a, the, the least on a per megahertz to megahertz basis spectrum compared to the other two uh, carriers. Um, and that's going to help in rural areas uh, with some aspects of the spectrum, uh, some frequencies, uh, suburban and urban as well. And so that will give uh, them a shot, a shot in the arm uh, to, to compete against them. And the only way to pay for that, back to the fundamental premise here, is to take market share away from AT&T and Verizon, not to sit on their hands. There's no Wall Street analyst who can tell you, whether it's Craig Moffat or whoever, that just sitting on their hands is the right way to go. That would be a breach of fiduciary duty. So there's two ways you compete, price and quality of service, and they're going to do both. Got it. Um, we are running low on time. We're going to do a couple very quick questions, single person. Jeff, for you, is this deal fixable? Um, we'll assume behavioral remedies are off the table, but 
Uh, the merger agreement has a really big divestiture cap, some combination of spectrum, brands, consumers, uh, tower leases. Is there a way to fix this transaction, create a new number four player, preserve some of the efficiencies that Rob has talked about? Uh, right, it would be very difficult. I mean, the harm from the merger is going from four to three. So unless uh, you have a, a nationwide fourth that could bring the necessary competition, you don't solve for uh, the merger harms. If you look at what happened in Europe, uh, there have been instances where they facilitated the entry of a fourth uh, in Italy, Iliad, uh, but they've actually been successful since. But absent some type of structural remedy that goes to the core of the harm, the merger is currently proposed uh, is anti-competitive and violates the public interest. And can I just add to that real quick, just extra time, which hopefully I get. So a, a couple things. DOJ, you know, Megan Del Rahim and Andrew Finch are saying that uh, behavioral remedies are, are not uh, what they want to, to have they want to deal with any merger, so structural only. But the FCC has, has different options, too. There are uh, two agencies. Uh, they will end up in the same place, by the way. They will not diverge. Um, but that's something just, you know, to put in the mix for the analysts out there, of course. Um, so, uh, so I don't think behavioral is necessarily off, off the table. Then back to Europe as well, which is if you just look at what happened uh, in the Netherlands, you had the European Commission approving, approving a T-Mobile deal uh, without conditions. So uh, you know, if we're going to start using Europe as a template, there are a lot of markets where there are three carriers, if you want to say that it's four to three, um, where those markets were the first to adopt smartphones and 4G technologies. And there's some other markets throughout the world too. Yeah, you got so. Canada. Um, yeah, okay. yeah. Just just to chime in one time uh, on the divestiture question um, so, or the behavioral remedies question. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, DOJ has said that it's you know not a not a big fan of behavioral uh, remedies. Um, you know, I think going back for the last year, we're seeing that with the uh, the AT and T uh, Time Warner litigation. Um, but just very quickly, uh, something that was very striking that the parties. Uh, put in their public interest statement, and they've they've argued time and again on the record, is that um, you know that that these MVNOs like uh, Charter and Comcast, which have you know fewer than like five hundred thousand subscribers a piece, um, or that Comcast is about a million. Right? All right, okay, so low, lower than a million. Um, the no, no, they're over a million. The re the report that the FCC released yesterday showed that Sprint had fifty five million subscribers. Um, that's down a little bit from fifty nine, but fifty five million subscribers. Um, the, the parties point to companies like DISH, for instance. And DISH, according to the parties, has about 13 million satellite subscribers. So their argument is that uh, consumers that don't want to be stuck with the oligopoly firms that are going to raise prices and not compete with one another uh, can just go to a company like DISH. Well, like DISH has Spectrum, but they don't yet have a consumer-facing wireless network. So, and frankly, even if, even if like tomorrow, DISH was able to turn on a wireless network, um, you're, you're asking them to, to, to take every single one of their satellite subscribers, turn them into a wireless subscriber, which, you know, that's, let's say that that's preposterous, because it is, um, immediately. Um, and then secondly, um, you know, they would, they would also have to spend money to build out their network, towers, base stations, uh, et cetera, fiber, et cetera. Um, so they do, they do all of those things. But you're still, even if you converted every single satellite customer to a wireless customer, you're still left with a company at 13 million subscribers. Sprint is making the argument that it is failing and can't compete, and it has 55 million subscribers. So you're talking about the company that's supposed to replace, and, and even smaller companies like US Cellular or C-Spy or Comcast or Charter and their wireless offerings are supposed to replace Sprint when the, the biggest company that's the potential competitor out there in the marketplace doesn't yet have a network that's operational, and it would have, uh, even if converted every single of its current customers, would be less than one-fourth the size of Sprint, which allegedly cannot compete. It, it, it's, it, it defies, you know, logic. Nate, I'm feeling left out here. Badly over time. I'm, I'm feeling Alan, left sorry. out. Last so, word. So I just, I, I just want to read a statement by... Um, Sprint management in May, okay, not so long ago. Don't expect any slowdown in our strategy from a network point of view. We will get this parity of 4G and leadership in 5G. That's critical. And whatever happens, we would have a terrific platform from a network point of view. That's with the merger in mind, whatever happens. So Sprint's in good shape. Sprint says it's in good shape. 
That's going to be the last word. Um, thank you, everybody. Great panel. Great exchange of ideas. Thank you, guys.